chapter fifty seven of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty seven many weak moments nothing less than steadfast faith and an ancient british constitution can have enabled me to survive this highly dappled period it was not in my body only or legs or parts i think nothing of but in my brain that i felt it most when i had the sense to feel it and having a brain which has no right to claim exemption from proper work because of being under average i happened to take a long time to recover from so many spots striking inwards an empty-headed man might have laughed at the little drills into his brain-pan but with me as with a good beehive early in october there could not be the prick of a brad all but went into honey and so my brain was in a buzz for at least a twelvemonth afterwards therefore i now must tell what happened rather as it is told to me than as myself remember it only you must not expect such truth as i always give while competent after the master of the ship defence had proved so unable to defend himself general sir philip bampfylde with his large and quiet mind forbidding all intrusion opened out a little of his goodness to jack wildman there are men of the highest station and of noble intellect who do this and cannot help it when they meet a fellow-man with something in him like them there is no vanity in it nor even desire to conciliate only a little touch of something understood between them and now being brought so together perhaps by their common kindliness and with the door of death wide open as it were before them the well-born and highly nurtured baronet and the lowly neglected and ignorant savage found perhaps all the more clearly from contrast something harmonious in each other at any rate they had a good deal of talk by the side of the lonely river where even the lighters kept aloof and hugged to the utmost the opposite shore and the general finding much amusement in poor jack's queer simplicity and strange remarks upon men and things would often relax without losing any of his accustomed dignity so while they were speaking of death one day jack looked at sir philip with an air of deep compassion and feeling and told him with tearful eyes how heartily he was grieved at one thing being pressed as to what it was he answered that it was sir philip's wealth because said he i am sad when i think that you must go to hell sir i go to hell sir philip exclaimed with a good deal of rather unpleasant surprise why should i do that jack i never thought that you entertained so bad an opinion of me your honour said jack having picked up some of my correct expressions it is not me it is god almighty i was told afore ever i learned to read or ever heard of reading how it was and so it is in the bible now poor men go to heaven rich men go to hell it must be so to be fair for both the general had too much sense to attempt to prove the opposite and would have thought no more about it if jack had dropped the subject but to do this at the proper moment requires great civilization while on the other hand jack sought comfort needless to men of refinement your honour must go there he said with a nod of his head which was meant to settle it but there is one of your race or family or whatever word of that sort he employed for he scarce could have come to any knowledge of things hereditary who will go to heaven many are gone there already too many answered sir philip devoutly but tell me whom you mean jack do you mean my son the captain 
him no no i know better than that it is plain where he must go to your captain your disloyal fellow why you ought to be lashed to the triangles but who is it you are thinking of i know i know said jack nodding his head and no more could sir philip get out of him and whenever he tried to begin again jack wildman was more than a match for him by feigning not to understand or by some other of the many tricks which nature supplies for self-defence to the savage against the civilised if i had been well i must have shelled this poor jack's meaning out of him whereas on the other hand but for my illness he might never have spoken so it came to pass that he was sent entirely at sir philip's cost and with a handsome gratuity to rejoin our captain in plymouth sound and to carry back cannibals dick and joe who had scoured away at great speed upon hearing of my sudden misfortune now i will tell you a very strange thing and quite out of my experience even after smallpox which enlarged and filled me with charity as well as what i had scarcely room for increase of humility that is that though captain bampfylde had some little spare time at plymouth he had such command of himself that he never went near his beloved isabel nothing could have so checked a man of hardiness and bravery except the strongest power of honour and a long time of chastisement there was a lovely young woman and here a fine though middle-aged man her husband they loved one another with heart and soul and they never met but through a telescope it may have been right or it may have been wrong i should have thought it wrong perhaps if the case had been my own but they pledged their honour and kept it drake bampfylde like his father had a strength of trust in providence but this trust has no landed security now that the lord has found the world so clever that he need not interfere with it the seventy-four gun ship defence was known to be the fastest sailer in the british navy not from her build alone or balance but from my careful trim of her sails and knowledge of how to handle her hours and hours i spent aloft among lifts and braces and clue garnets marking the draw of every sail and writing all useless bellying so that i could now have warranted her the first of our navy to break the line if rigged according to my directions and with me for her master however while i lay docked like this careened i might say and unlikely ever to carry a keel again the defence without my knowledge even being new-masted sailed to join the channel fleet with heavy side acting as her master and as might have been expected fell to leeward one knot in three and even worse than this befell her for in the second of those two miserable actions under hotham in the year seventeen hundred and ninety five when even nelson could do nothing the defence having now another captain as well as a stupid master actually backed her mizzen topsail in the rear of the enemy when the signal was to fill and stand on however as even that famous ship the agamemnon did nothing that day through getting no opportunity we must forgive poor heaviside especially as he was not captain but the one who ground his teeth the hardest and could forgive nobody was the honourable rodney bluett now first lieutenant of the defence by this time every one must desire to know why captain bampfylde was not there as he might have been and might have made himself famous before his usual ill fortune this had carried him to the east indies before the defence had finished refitting and there with none of his old hands near him he commanded a line of battle ship under commodore Rainier, and after some hard work and very fine fighting drove the brave dutchman out of the castle of trincomalee in august seventeen hundred and ninety five which we came to hear of afterwards thus it was that everybody seemed to be scattered everywhere 
none of us happened to hold together except those three poor savages and they by a sort of instinct managed to get over accidents for they stuck with that fidelity which is lost by education to rodney bluett as soon as ever poor father davy failed them but this is a melancholy subject and must soon be done with let me then not dwell upon this visitation of the lord for a moment longer than the claims of nation and of kin combined to make it needful nor did it seem to matter much for a long time what became of me the very first thing i remember after months of wandering has something to do with the hush of waves and the soft breath of heaven spread over me also kind young voices seem to be murmuring around me with a dear regard and love and sense of pretty watchfulness and the sound of my native tongue as soft as the wool of a nest to my bosom because i was lying in a hammock slung by colonel lower's orders betwixt the very same mooring posts at about half tide in newton bay which truly enabled the sons of devon to make such a safe job of stealing his rocks not only the colonel but lady bluett who generally led his judgment felt by this time the pleasure of owing true gratitude to somebody my fatherly care of the young lieutenant had turned him out so nobly it misbecomes me to speak of this and it misbecame me to speak at all with the sea breeze flowing over me the first words of knowledge that i had spoken for how long i know not nothing can be too high or too low for human nature at both ends but i ought to have known better than to do the thing i did give me a pipe was all i said and then i turned away and cared not whether i got my pipe or whether the rising tide extinguished me here is your pipe sir came in a beautiful voice from down below me and we have the tinder ready bunny let me do it now that pipe must have saved my life everybody said so it came and went in curls of comfort through the hollow dying places of my head that had not even blood enough to call for it and then it never left my soul uneasy about anything hammock and all must have gone afloat with the rapid rise of the spring except for colonel lower's foresight who was it that watched me so and would have waited by my side until the waves were over her who was it that kept on listening to let me know while i could not speak who was it that gave a little bit of a sigh every now and then and then breathed hard to smother it who was it or who could it be in the whole wide world but bardie not only this but when i began to be up to real sense again the kindness of every one around me made me fit for nothing in the weakness of expecting all to take advantage of me as is done in health and spirits all the weakness i could find was in my friends and neighbours always labouring to encourage me this to my mind proves almost the wrongness of expecting people to be worse than we are that winter was the most severe all over western europe known for five and fifty years i well remember the dreadful winter a d seventeen hundred and forty when the severn was frozen with a yard of ice and the whole of the bristol channel blocked with icebergs like great hayricks twelve people were frozen to death in our parish and seven were killed through the ice on the sea the winter of seventeen hundred and ninety five was nothing to be compared to that nevertheless it was very furious and killed more than we could spare of our very oldest inhabitants and but for the extraordinary kindness of colonel lower that winter must have killed not only me in my weak and worn-out condition but also the poor maid of scar if left to encounter the cold in that iceberg for truly speaking the poor old house was nothing else through the, that winter 
the snow in swirling sheets of storm first wrapped it up to the window-sills and then in a single night overleaped gables roofs and chimney-tops moxy and watkin passed a month of bitter cold and darkness but were lucky enough to have some sheep who kept them warm outside and warmed their insides afterwards and after that the thaw came but all this time there was nobody in my little cottage at newton but poor roger burkrolls and how he kept soul and body together is known to none save himself in heaven for colonel lower and lady bluett at the beginning of the frost sent down by old friend crumpy the butler to report upon my condition and to give his candid opinion what was the best thing to do with me after that long struggle now thanks to a fine constitution and the death of the only doctor anywhere on our side of bridge end i had begun to look up a little and to know the time of day crumpy felt my pulse and nodded and then prescribed the only medicine which his own experience in life had ever verified port wine he said was the only thing to put me on my legs again and this he laid before the colonel with such absence of all doubt that on the very same afternoon a low and slow carriage was sent for me and i found myself laid in a very snug room with the firelight dancing in the reflection of the key of the wine cellar also here was bardie flitting light as a gnat in springtime and bunny to be had whenever anybody wanted her only her scantling and her tonnage unfitted her for frigate service what had a poor old fellow like me as in weak moments i called myself ever done or ever suffered to deserve to find the world an inn of good samaritans i felt that it was all of pure unreasonable kindness the very thing which a man of spirit cannot bear to put up with i have felt this often when our parson discoursed about our gracious lord and all the things he did for us a man of proper self-respect would like to have had a voice in it this however as hezekiah told us in the cockpit after we had pickled him might be safely attributed to the force of unregeneracy while a man who is down in luck and constitution also trusts to any stout mortal for a loan of orthodoxy and so did i to our rector lower brother of the colonel a gentleman who had bought my fish and felt my spiritual needs to him i listened for well he read especially a psalm to which i could for ever listen full of noble navigation deeper even than our soundings in the bay of biscay every night we used to wonder where lieutenant bluett was knowing as we did from my descriptions when the hob was hot what it is to be at sea with all the rigging freezing when the blocks are clogged with ice and make mysterious groanings and the shrouds have grown a beard as cold as their own name is and the deck begins to slip and all the watch with ropes to handle spit upon their palms and strike them dancing with their toes the while one man to another man's hoping to see sparks come out so it is i can assure you who have never been at sea when the barbs of icy spray by a freezing wind are driven like a volley of languel shot raking the ship from stem to stern shrivelling blue cheeks and red noses shattering quids from the chattering teeth many a time in these bitter nights with the roar of east wind through the fir trees and the rattle of doors in the snowdrift i felt ashamed of my cosy berth and could not hug my comfort from thinking of my ancient messmates turned to huddled icicles but all was ordained for the best no doubt for supposing that i had been at sea through the year seventeen hundred and ninety five or even seventeen hundred and ninety six what single general action was there worthy of my presence it might have been otherwise with me there 
and in a leading position however even of this i cannot by any means be certain for seamen quite as brave and skilful were afloat at that very time however beyond a few frigate actions and matters far away from home at the cape or in the east indies i did not hear of anything that i need have longed much to partake in so that i did not repent of accepting a harbour appointment at plymouth which upon my partial recovery was obtained for me by sir philip bampfylde an old friend of the port admiral there for that good sir philip was a little uneasy after shipping me off last autumn lest he might have behaved with any want of gratitude towards me of course he had done nothing of the kind for in truth i had raved for my country so as i came to learn long afterwards that when all the risk of infection was over the doctor from barnstaple said that my only chance of recovering reason lay in the air of my native land but at any rate this kind baronet thought himself bound to come and look after me in the spring of the year when the buds were awake and the iron was gone from the soul of the earth he had often promised that fine old tyrant anthony stew to revisit him so now he resolved to kill two birds with one stone as the saying is i had returned to my cottage now but being still very frail and stupid in spite of port wine every day i could not keep the tears from starting when this good and great landowner bent his silver head beneath my humble lintel and forbade me in his calm majestic manner to think for a moment of dousing my pipe and even justice stew who of course took good care to come after him did not use an uncivil word when he saw what sir philip thought of me sir said the general to the squire after shaking hands most kindly with me this is a man whom i truly respect there seems to be but one opinion about him i call him a noble specimen of your fellow-countrymen yes to be sure answered anthony stew but my noble fellow-countrymen say that i am an irishman no doubt whatever about that your worship was the proper thing for me to reply but the condition of my head forbade me almost to shake it if it had pleased the lord to give me only a dozen holes and scars which could not matter at my time of life there would not by any means have arisen as all the old women of newton said this sad pressure on the brain-pan and difficulty of coping even with a man of anthony stew's kind but alas instead of opening out the subtle plague struck inwards leaving not a sign outside but a delicate transparency this visit from sir philip did not end without a queer affair whereof i had no notice then being set down by all the village as only fit to poke about among the sand-hills and then to die but no one could take the church clock from me till the bell should be tolling for me and as a matter of duty i drew some long arrears of salary it seems that sir philip drove down one day from pencode to look after me and having done this with his usual kindness spread word through the children who throughout our lane abounded that really none of his money remained for any more sticks of peppermint it was high time for them to think he said after ever so much education of earning from sevenpence to tenpence a week for the good of the babies they carried all the children gathered round him at this fine idea really not believing quite that the purse of such a gentleman could have nothing more to say and the girls bearing babes were concave in the back while the boys in the same predicament stuck out clumsily where their spines were setting drive me away said sir philip to the groom drive me straight away anywhere these welsh children are so clever i shall have no chance with them indeed your honour they is said the groom with a grin as behooved a welshman would your honour like to go down by the sea and see our beautiful water-rocks and our old ancient places to be sure 
said sir philip the very thing we have four hours time to dinner yet and i fear i have worn out poor llewellyn now follow the coast-line if you are sure that your master would like it lewis with this young horse and our weight behind your honour nothing ever comes amiss to this young horse here tis tire i should like to see him for a change as we do say and master do always tell me keep salt water on his legs whenever right cried sir philip who loved the spree being as full of spirits still when the air took his trouble out of him as the young horse in the shafts was so they drove away over the sands towards scar which it is easy enough to do with a good strong horse and a light car behind him and by this time the neighbourhood had quite forgotten all its dread of sandstorms in about half an hour they found themselves in a pretty place of grass and firs known as the locks common which faces the sea over some low cliffs and at the western end coves down to it this is some half a mile from scar house and a ragged dry wall makes the parish boundary severing it from scarland drive on cried sir philip i enjoy all this i call this really beautiful and this fine sward reminds me of devonshire but they ought to plant some trees here the driver replied that there was some danger in driving through scar warren unless one knew the ground thoroughly on account of the number of rabbit holes and the baronet with that true regard which a gentleman feels for the horse of a friend cancelled his order immediately but he continued i am so thirsty that i scarcely know what to do my friend llewellyn's hospitality is so overpowering the taste of rum is almost unknown to me but i could not refuse when he pressed me so it has made me confoundedly thirsty lewis your honour said lewis just round that corner in a little break of the rocks there is one of the finest springs in glamorgan by non when we call it the water does be sparkling so the groom having no cup to fetch the water stood by the horse in the little pant or comb while old sir philip went down to the shore to drink as our first forefather drank and gideon's men in the bible whether he lapped or dipped i know not probably the latter at his time of life anyhow he assuaged his thirst which rum of my quality could not have caused in a really sound constitution after taking no more than a thimbleful and then for a moment he sat on a rock soothed by the purling water to rest and to look around him the place has no great beauty as of a seaside spring in devonshire but more of cheer and life about it than their ferny grottoes the bright water breaks from an elbow of rock in many veins all uniting and without any cliff above them and then after rushing a very few yards through set stone and loose shingle loses its self-will upon the soft sand and spreads away over a hundred yards of vague wetness and shallow shining the mild sun of april was glancing on this and the tide just advancing to see to it when the shadow of a slim figure fell on the stones before sir philip so quietly had she slipped along and appeared from the rock so suddenly that neither old man nor young maiden thought of the other until their eyes met what why who cried the general with something as much like a start as good conscience and long service had left in him who are you who are you my dear for his eyes were fixed on a fair young damsel of some fifteen summers standing upright with a pad on her head and on the pad a red pitcher over her shoulders and down to her waist fell dark brown curls abundantly full of gleaming gold where the sun stole through the rocks to dwell in them her dress was nothing but blue welsh flannel gathered at the waist and tucked in front and her beautifully tinted legs and azure veined feet shone under it who are you my pretty creature sir philip bampfylde asked 
looked again while she opened her grey eyes wide at him e ferch or scar sir she answered shyly and with the strong guttural tone which she knew was unpleasant to english ears for it was her sensitive point that she could not tell any one who she was and her pride which was manifold always led her to draw back from questions on the other hand the old man's gaze of strong surprise and deep interest faded into mere admiration at the sound of our fine language fair young cambrian i have asked you rudely and you are displeased with me lift your curls my little dear and let me see your face a while i remember one just like it there you are put out again so it was with the one i mean when anything happened hastily the beautiful girl flung back her hair and knelt to stoop her pitcher in the gurgling runnel and then she looked at his silver locks and was sorry for her impatience sir i beg you to forgive me if i have been rude to you i am the maid from the old house yonder i am often sent for this water because it sparkles much more than our own does if you please i must go home sir she filled the red pitcher and tucked the blue skirt as girls alone can manage it and sir philip bampfylde sighed at thinking of his age and loneliness while with an old-fashioned gentleman's grace he lifted the pitcher and asked no more upon whose head he laid it End of chapter fifty seven chapter fifty eight of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty eight more haste less speed to do what is thoroughly becoming and graceful is my main desire that any man should praise himself and insist upon his own exploits and services to his native land or even should let people guess at his valour by any manner of side wind such a course would simply deprive me of the only thing a poor battered sailor has left to support him against his pension i mean of course humble but nevertheless well-grounded self-respect this delicacy alone forbids me even to allude to that urgent and universal call for my very humble services which launched me on the briny waves once more and in time for a share in the glorious battle fought off cape st vincent upon that great st valentine's day of seventeen hundred and ninety seven i was master of the excellent under captain collingwood and every boy in the parish knows how we captured the st isidore and really took the st nicholas though other people got the credit and nearly took a four-decked ship of one hundred and thirty guns whose name was the st miss trinder and who managed to sneak away when by all rights we had got her however let us be content with things beyond contradiction the foremost of which is that no ship ever was carried into action in a more masterly style than the excellent upon that occasion and the weight of this falls on the master far more than the captain i do assure you so highly were my skill and coolness commended in the despatches that if i could have borne to be reduced below inferior men i might have died a real captain in the british navy for as happened to the now captain bowen when master of the queen charlotte i was offered a lieutenant's commission and doubted about accepting it had i been twenty years younger of course i must have jumped at the offer but at my time of life and with all my knowledge it would have been too painful to be ordered about by some young dancer therefore i declined at the same time thinking it fair 
to suggest for the sake of the many true britons now dependent upon me that a small pecuniary remittance would meet with my consideration that faculty of mine however was not called to the encounter i never heard more about it and had to be satisfied with glory but if a man is undervalued often and puts up with it he generally finds that fortune treats him with respect in other more serious aspects for instance what would have happened if providence had ordained to send me into either of those sad mutinies which disgraced our fleet so terribly that deep respect for authority which like the yolk of a nest egg lies calmly inside me waiting to be sat upon as well as my inborn sense of nature's resistless determination to end by turning me into a gentleman indications of which must have long ago been perceived by every reader not to mention any common sense of duty in the abstract and wages in the pocket these considerations must have led me to lay a pistol to the head of almost every man i could find however from such a course of action grace and mercy preserved me and perhaps it was quite as well for i am not sure that i could have stopped any one of the four mutinies entirely although i can answer for it that never would bad manners take the lead in any ship while i was master it is the shilly-shallying that produces all the mischief if all our captains had behaved like captain peard and his first lieutenant in the st george off cadiz at the first spread of disaffection it is my opinion that a great disgrace and danger would have been crushed in the bud but what could be expected when our government showed the like weakness twice they went hankering after peace and even sent ambassadors who can ram shot home with pleasure while things of this kind are encouraged to fight it out is the true christianity ordered by the church itself and this we did and are doing still as roger burke rolls prophesied and the only regret i have about it is that a stiffness in my knees enables the other boarders to take a mean advantage of their youth and jump into the chains or portholes of a ship when by my tactics conquered so as to get a false lead of me however no small consolation was to be gained by reflecting how much more prize money would accrue to me than to any of these forward fellows so that one might with an unmoved leg contemplate their precipitancy even a sore grievance was the breaking up and dispersion of our noble and gallant ship's company so long accustomed to one another and to sharp discipline in the defence where was captain bampfylde where was lieutenant rodney bluett what was become of our three fine savages even heaviside and hezekiah were in my thoughts continually and out of my knowledge entirely as to the latter worthy gunsmith artillerist to the king and queen and all the royal family i can only at present say that when i had been last at home and before my acceptance of that brief appointment in the plymouth dockyard in short when first i recovered strength after that long illness to cope with the walk both to and fro i found occasion to go to bridge and with my uniform on for the sake of the town i had not turned the corner of the bridge a good half hour before that important fact was known from the river bank to the churchyard and griffith of the cat and snuffers set up such a welsh hurrah as good as the screech of a wildcat trapped that it went up the hill to newcastle in a word hepzibah heard of me and ran down the hill like a roaring lion demanding her hezekiah what ensued is painful to me even now to speak of for though my conscience was refitting and ready to knock about again after carrying too much sail i could not find it in my heart to give the mother of a rapid family nothing but lies to feed upon many men of noble nature dwell upon nothing but conscience as if that were the one true compass for a man to steer by whereas i never did find a man 
outside my own sunday clothes whose conscience would not back him up in whatever he had a mind for my own had always worked like a power plainly exposed to every one thereby gaining strength and revolving as fast as a mountain windmill when the corn is falling away to chaff this however was not required in the present instance for hepzibah like a good woman fell from one extreme into the opposite from bitter reviling to praise and gratitude was but a turn of the tongue to her especially when i happened to whisper into the ear of griffith that the whole of my stipend for newton church clock would now according to my views of justice be handed to hezekiah's wife inasmuch as the worthy gunsmith had rejoined the church of england and i said what a dreadful blow this would be to all the nicodemites when the gun officer returned with money enough to build a chapel however i felt that it served them right because they had lately begun to sneer at his good wife's wonderful prophecies in a word i had promised to find hezekiah and both while in harbour and now when afloat i tried to get tidings not only of him but also of the newton tailor and heaviside and the three wild men as well as young harry savage lieutenant bluett and captain bampfylde for all these being at sea and in war time who could say what had befallen them whereas i knew all about most of our people now living ashore in the middle of peace however of course one must expect old shipmates to be parted and with all the vast force now afloat under the british flag it would almost be a wonder if any of us should haul our wind within hailing distance of the others during our cruise in this world nevertheless it did so happen as i plainly will set forth so far as i remember through the rest of the year ninety seven and the early part of the following year i was knocking about off and on near the straits being appointed to another ship while the excellent was refitting and afterwards to the goliath a fine seventy four under captain foley in the month of may seventeen hundred and ninety eight all our mediterranean fleet except three ships of the line lay blockading cadiz our admiral the earl st vincent formerly sir john jervis had orders also to watch toulon where a great fleet was assembling and our information was so scant and contradictory that our admiral sent but three ships of the line and a frigate or two to see what those crafty frenchmen might be up to but this searching squadron had a commander whose name was horatio nelson this was not by any means the man to let frog-eaters do exactly as they pleased with us i believe in the king of england i have faith and discipline i abhor all frenchmen worse than the very devil such was his creed and at any moment he would give his life for it it is something for a man to know what he means and be able to put it clearly and this alone fetches to his side more than half of the arguers who cannot make their minds up but it is a much rarer gift and not often combined with the other for a man to enter into and be able to follow up ways and turns and ins and outs of the natures of all other men if this is done by practised subtlety it arouses hatred and can get no further but if it be a gift of nature exercised unwittingly and with kind love of manliness all who are worth bringing over are brought over by it if it were not hence i know not whence it was that nelson had such power over every man of us to know what he meant to pronounce it and to perceive what others meant these three powers enabled him to make all the rest mean what he did at any rate such is my opinion although i would not fly in the face of better scholars than myself who declared that here was witchcraft what else could account for the manner in which all nelson's equals in rank at once acknowledged him as the foremost and felt no jealousy towards him even admiral earl st vincent great commander as he was is said to have often deferred to the judgment of the younger officer as for the men they all looked upon it as worth a gold watch to sail under him therefore we officers of the inshore squadron under captain truebridge could scarcely keep our crews from the most tremendous and uproarious cheers when we got orders to make sail for the mediterranean and place ourselves under the command of nelson we could not allow any cheering because the dons ashore were not to know a word about our departure 
lest they should inform the crapos under whose orders they now were acting and a british cheer has such a ring over the waters of the sea and leaps from wave to wave so that i have heard it a league away when roused up well to windward so our fine fellows had leave to cheer to their hearts content when we got our offing and partly under my conduct for i led the way in the goliath nine seventy-fours got away to sea in the night of the twenty fourth of may and nine liners from england replaced them without a single jack spaniard ever suspecting any movement every one knows what a time we had of it after joining our admiral how we dashed away helter-skelter from one end of the world to the other almost in a thorough wild goose chase because the board of admiralty with their usual management sent thirteen ships of the line especially on a searching scurry without one frigate to scout for them we were obliged to sail of course within signalling distance of each other and so that line of battle might be formed without delay upon appearance of the enemy for we now had a man whose signal was go at em when you see em also as always comes to pass when the sons of beelzebub are abroad a thick haze lay both day and night upon the face of the water so that while sailing in close order upon the night of the shortest day we are said to have crossed the wake of the frenchmen almost ere it grew white again without even sniffing their roasted frogs possibly this is true in spite of all the great nelson's vigilance for i went to my hammock quite early that night having suffered much from a hollow eye-tooth ever since i lost sight of poor polly admiral nelson made no mistake he had in the highest degree what is called in human nature genius and in dogs and horses instinct that is to say he knew how to sniff out the road to almost anything trusting to this tenfold when he found that our government would not hear of it but was nearly certain of a mighty landing upon ireland off he set for egypt carrying on with every blessed sail that would or even would not draw we came to that coast at a racing speed and you should have seen his vexation when there was no french ship in the roadstead i have made a false cast drew bridge he cried i shall write to be superseded my want of judgment may prove fatal to my king and country for our government had sent him word through the earl st vincent that the great expedition from toulon would sail for england or ireland and he at his peril had taken upon him to reject such nonsense but now as happens by nature's justice to all very sanguine men he was ready to smite the breast that had suggested pure truth to him thus being baffled we made all sail and after a chase of six hundred leagues and continually beating to windward were forced to bear up on st swithin's day and make for the coast of sicily and it shows the value of good old hands and thoroughly sound experience that i the oldest man perhaps in the fleet could alone guide the fleet into syracuse here our fierce excitement bubbled while we took in water End of chapter fifty eight chapter fifty nine of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty nine in a rocky bower i never hear of a man's impatience without sagely reflecting upon the rapid flight of time when age draws on and business thickens and all the glory of this world must soon be left behind us from the date of my great catch of fish and landing of bardie at pool taven to the day of my guiding the british fleet betwixt the shoals of syracuse more than sixteen years had passed and scarce left time to count them therefore it was but a natural thing that the two little maidens with whom i began should now be grown up and creating a stir in the minds of young men of the neighbourhood early in this present month of july that northwest breeze which was baffling our fleet off the coast of anatolia was playing among the rocks of scar with the curls and skirts and ribbons of these two fair young damsels or rather with the ribbons of one for bunny alone wore streamers wherein her heart delighted while the maid of scar was dressed as plainly as if she had been her servant 
not that her inborn love of brightness ever had abandoned her but that her vanities were put down quite arrogantly by master burkrolls whenever she came back from candleston and but for her lessons in music there which were beyond roger's compass he would have raised his voice against her visits to the good colonel for the old man's heart was entirely fixed upon the graceful maiden and his chief anxiety was to keep her out of the way of harm he knew that the colonel loved nothing better as behooved his lineage than true and free hospitality and he feared that the simple and nameless girl might set her affections on some grand guest who would scorn her derelict origin now she led bunny into a cave or rather a snug little cove of rock which she always called her cradle and where she had spent many lonely hours in singing pure welsh melodies of the sweetest sadness feeling a love of the desert places from her own desertion then down she sat in her chair of stone with limpets and barnacles studying it while bunny in the established manner bounced down on a pebble and gazed at her my son's daughter was a solid girl very well built as our family is and raking most handsomely fore and aft her fine black eyes and abiding colour and the modesty inherited from her grandfather and some reflection perhaps of his fame made her a favourite everywhere and any grandfather might well have been proud to see how she carried her dress off the younger maid sat right above her quite as if nature had ordered it so and drew her skirt of home-spun camlet over her dainty feet because the place was wet and chilly and anybody looking must have said that she was born to grace the clear outlines of oval face and delicate strength of forehead were moulded as by nature only can such dainty work be done gentle pride and quiet moods of lonely meditation had deepened and subdued the radiance of the large grey eyes and changed the dancing mirth of childhood into soft intelligence and it must have been a fine affair with the sunshine glancing on the breezy sea to take a look at the lights and shadows of so clear a countenance bunny like a frigate riding doused her head and all her outworks forward of the bends and then hung fluttering and doubtful just as if she had missed stays it is not your engagement my dear bunny began delushy as if she were ten years the senior officer you must not suppose for a moment that i object to your engagement it is time of course for you to think among so many suitors of some one to put up with especially after what you told me about having toothache and watkin is thoroughly good and kind and able to read quite respectably but what i blame you for is this that you have not been straightforward bunny why have you kept me in the dark about this one of your many sweetheartings as you always call them and for sure miss then i never did no such thing unless it was that i thought you was wanting him i you surely cannot have thought it i want watkin thomas well miss you need not fly out like that all the girls in newton was after him and if it wasn't you as wanted him it might be him as wanted you which comes to the same thing always i don't quite think that it does dear bunny though you may have made it do so now look up and kiss me dear you know that i love you very much though i have a way of saying things and then i am longing to beg pardon when i have vexed any one it comes of my noble birth i suppose which the girls of newton laugh about how i wish that i were but the child of the poorest good man in the parish but now i am tired of thinking of it what good ever comes of it and what can one poor adam matter you are not a poor adam you are the best and the cleverest and most learnedest and most beautifulest lady as ever was seen in the whole of the land after or rather in the middle of which words our bunny with her usual vigour and true national ardour leaped into the arms of delushy so that they had a good cry together you will wait of course for your granny to come before you settle anything will i indeed cried that wicked bunny and lucky for her that i was not there 
i shall do nothing of the sort if he chooses to be always away at sea conquering the french for ever and never coming home when he can help it he must make up his mind to be surprised when he happens to come home again for sure then that is right enough well it does seem almost reasonable answered the young lady and i think sometimes that we have no right to expect so much as that of things it is not what they often do and so they lose the habit of it i do not quite understand said bunny and i don't half understand said bardie but oh my dear what shall i do he is coming this way i am sure and i would not have you know anything of it and of course you must feel that it is all nonsense and i did not mean any harm about courting only you ought to be out of the way and yet at the same time in it our bunny was such a slow-witted girl and at the same time so particular inheriting slowness from her good mother and conscience from third generation that really she could make no hand at meeting such a crisis for now she began to perceive gold lace which alone discomfits the woman race and sets their minds going upon what they love and so she did very little else but stare i did think you would have helped me bunny delus she cried with aggrievement i wanted to hear your own affairs of course but i would not have brought you here young ladies well met cried as solid a voice as the chops of the channel had ever tautened i knew that you were here and so i came down to look after you sure then sir and i do think that it is very kind of you we was just a wanting looking after oh what a fish i do see in that pool please only you now both to keep back i shall be back again now just sir with these words away flew bunny as if her life were set on it what a fine creature to be sure said commander bluett thoughtfully she reminds me so much of her grandfather there is something so strongly alike between them in their reckless outspoken honour as well as in the turn of the nose they have let us follow and admire her a little more cried delushy she deserves it as you say and perhaps well perhaps she likes it young rodney looked at her a little while and then at the ground a little while because he was a stupid fellow as concerns young women he thought this one such a perfect wonder as may well be said of all of them then those two fenced about a little out of shot of each other's eyes there was no doubt between them as to the meaning of each other but they both seemed to think it wise to have a little bit of vexing before doing any more and thus they looked at one another as if there was nothing between them and all the time how they were longing i must have yes or no for rodney could not outlast the young lady yes or no you know what i mean i am almost always at sea and to-morrow i start to join nelson with him there is no play-work i hope to satisfy him though i know what he is to satisfy but i hope to do it of course you will delushy answered you seem to give great satisfaction almost everywhere i am sure do i give it you proud creature where i long to give it most how can i pretend to say without being told in what latitude even as i think your expression is this amiable desire lies as if you did not know delushy as if i did know captain bluett and another thing i am not to be called delushy much in that way very well then much in another way delushy delush delicious delushy what makes you so unkind to me to-morrow i go away and perhaps we shall never meet again delushy and then how you would reproach yourself don't you think you would now when never and then come together yes i suppose all sailors talk so if i cannot even talk to please you there is nothing more to say i think that the bards have turned your head with their harpings and their fiddle-strings and ballads in very bad welsh no doubt about the charming maid of scar and so on when you are old enough to know better and the young conceit wears out of you you may be sorry miss andalusia for your wonderful cleverness he made her a bow with his handsome hat and her warm young heart was chilled by it surely he ought to have shaken hands she tried to keep her own meaning at home and bid him farewell with a curtsey while he tried not to look back again but fortune or nature was too much for them and their eyes met wistfully these things are out of my line so much that i cannot pretend to say now for a moment what these very young people did and everybody else having done the same with more or less unwisdom according to constitution may admire the power of charity which restrains me from describing them my favourite writer of scripture is st paul who was afraid of nobody and who spent his time in making sails when the thorn in the flesh permitted him 
and this great writer describes the quick manners of maidens far better than i can wherefore i keep myself up aloft until they have had a good spell of it i have no opinion now what can you expect of me rodney i must stop and think for nearly a quarter of a century before i have an opinion then stay just so and let me admire you till i have to swim with you rodney you are reckless here comes the tide and you know i have got my very best candlestone side lace boots on then come out of this rocky bower which suits your fate so darling and let us talk most sensibly by all means if you think we can there you need not touch me rodney i can get out very well indeed i know these rocks better than you do perhaps now sit on this rock where old david first hooked me as i have heard that old chatterbox tell fifty times as if he had done some great great thing he did indeed a grand grand thing no wonder that he is proud of it and he has so much to be proud of that you may take it for your highest compliment perhaps there is no other man in the service or i might say in all the civilized world but it hurts me to tell what this excellent officer said or even thought of me he was such a first-rate judge by this time that i must leave his opinion blank over the sea they began to look in a discontented quietude as the manner of young mortals is before they begin to know better and with great ideas moving them bunny with the very kindest discretion had run away entirely and might now be seen at the far end of the sands and springing up the rocks on her way to newton so those two sat side by side with their hearts full of one another and their minds made up to face the world together whatever might come of it for as yet they could see nothing clearly through the warm haze of loving being wrapped up in an atmosphere which generally leads to a hurricane but to them for a few short minutes earth and sea and sky were all one universal heaven it will not do cried the maid of scar suddenly awaking with a short deep sigh and drawing back her delicate hand from the broad palm of young rodney it will never never do we must both be mad to think of it who could fail to be mad he answered if you set the example now don't be so dreadfully stupid rodney what i say is most serious of course you know the world better than i do as you told me yesterday after sailing a dozen times round it but i am thinking of other things not of what the world will say but of what i myself must feel and the first of these things is that i cannot be cruelly ungrateful it would be the deepest ingratitude to the colonel if i went on with it went on with it what a way to speak as if you could be off with it when you pleased and my good uncle loves you like his own daughter and so does my mother now what can you mean as if you did not know indeed now rodney do talk sensibly i ought to know if any one does what your uncle and your mother are and i know that they would rather see your death in the gazette than your marriage with an unknown nameless nobody like me sir well of course we must take the chance of that said captain bluett carelessly the colonel is the best soul in the world and my dear mother a most excellent creature whenever she listens to reason but as to my asking their permission it is the last thing i should dream of i am old enough to know my own mind and to get my own living i should hope as well as that of my family and if i am only in time with nelson of course we shall do wonders for a minute or two the poor young maid had not a word to say to him she longed to throw her arms around him when he spoke so proudly and to indulge her own pride in him as against all the world beside but having been brought up in so much trouble she had learned to check herself so that she did nothing more than wait for him to go on again and this he did with sparkling eyes and the confidence of a young british tar there is another thing my beauty which they are bound to consider as well as all the prize money i shall earn and that is that they have nobody except themselves to thank for it they must have known what was sure to happen if they chose to have you there whenever i was home from sea and my mother is so clever too to my mind it is plain enough that they meant me to do what i have done and pray what is that as if you did not know come now you must pay the penalty of asking for a compliment talk about breeding and good birth and that stuff why look at your hands and then look at mine put your fingers between mine both hands both hands that's the way now just feel my great clumsy things and then see how lovely yours are as clear as wax tapers and just touched with rose and every nail with a fairy gift and pointed like an almond a nameless nobody indeed what nameless nobody ever had such nails by way of contrast examine mine 
oh but you bite yours shockingly rodney i am sure that you do though i never saw you you must be cured of that dreadful trick that shall be your first job delushy when you are mrs rodney now for another great sign of birth do you see any peak to my upper lip no i can't say i do but how foolish you are i ought to be crying and you make me laugh then just let me show you the peak to yours honour bright and no mean advantages that is to say if i can help it oh here's that blessed moxy coming may the frenchman rob her hen-roost now just one promise darling darling just one little promise to-morrow i go to most desperate battles and lucky to come home with one arm and one leg therefore promise a solemn promise to have no one in the world but me i think said the maid with her lips to his ear in the true old coaxing fashion that i may very well promise that but i will promise another thing too and that is not to have even you until your dear mother and good uncle come to me and ask me and that can never never be end of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty nelson and the nile the first day of august in the year of our lord seventeen hundred and ninety eight is a day to be long remembered by every briton with a piece of constitution in him for on that day our glorious navy under the immortal nelson administered to the frenchman under admiral brewer as pure and perfect a lathering as is to be found in all history this i never should venture to put upon my own authority especially after the prominent part assigned therein by providence to a humble individual who came from newton nottage for with history i have no patience at all because it always contradicts the very things i have seen and known but i am bound to believe a man of such high principles and deep reading as master roger burke rolls and he tells me that i have helped to produce the greatest of all great victories be that one way or the other i can tell you every word concerning how we managed it and you need not for one moment think me capable of prejudice quite the contrary i assure you there could not have been in the british fleet any man more determined to do justice to all crapos than a thoroughly ancient navigator now master of the goliath we knew exactly what to do every captain every master every quartermaster even the powder monkeys had their proper work laid out for them the spirit of nelson ran through us all and our hearts caught fire from his heart from the moment of our first glimpse at the frenchman spread out in that tempting manner beautifully moored and riding in a long fine head and stern every old seaman among us began to count on his fingers prize money they thought that we would not fight that night for the sun was low when we found them and with their perpetual conceit they were hard at work taking water in i shall never forget how beautiful these ships looked and how peaceful a french ship always sits the water with an elegant quickness like a frenchwoman at the looking-glass and though we brought the evening breeze in very briskly with us there was hardly swell enough in the bay to make them play their hawsers many fine things have i seen and therefore know pretty well how to look at them which a man never can do upon the first or even the second occasion but it was worth any man's while to live to the age of threescore years and eight with a sound mind and a sound body and eyes almost as good as ever if there were nothing for it more than to see what i saw at this moment six and twenty ships of the line thirteen bearing the tricolour and riding cleared for action the other thirteen with the red cross flying the cross of st george on the ground of white and tossing the blue water from their stems under pressure of canvas onward rushed our british ships as if every one of them was alive and driven out of all patience by the wicked escapes of the enemy twelve hundred leagues of chase 
had they cost us in gratitude towards god every night and love of the devil at morning with dread of our country for ever prevailing and mistrust of our own good selves and now at last we had got them tight and mean we did to keep them captain foley came up to me as i stood on the ratlines to hear the report of the men in the starboard fore chains and his fine open face was clouded master he said how much more of this damn your soundings can't you see that the zealous is drawing ahead of us hood has nobody in the chains if you can't take the ship into action i will stand by there to set top gallant sails these had been taken in scarce five minutes agone as prudence demanded for none of us had any chart of the bay and even i knew little about it except that there was a great shoal of rock betwixt abu Kur island and the van ship of the enemy and but for my warning we might have followed the two french brigs appointed to decoy us in that direction now having filled top-gallant sails we rapidly headed our rival though zealous in spite of all that she could do and we had the honour of receiving the first shot of the enemy for now we were rushing in stern on having formed line of battle towards the van of the anchored frenchman now as to what followed and the brilliant idea which occurred to somebody to turn the enemy's line and take them on the larboard or inner side on which they were quite unprepared for attack no two authorities are quite agreed simply because they all are wrong some attribute this grand manoeuvre to our great admiral nelson others to captain hood of the zealous and others to our captain foley this latter is nearest the mark but from whom did captain foley obtain the hint modesty forbids me to say what welshman it was who devised this noble and most decisive stratagem while well, patriotic duty compels me to say that it was a welshman and more than that a glamorganshire man born in a favoured part of the quiet village of in in enough unless i add that internal evidence will convince any unprejudiced person that none but an ancient fisherman and thoroughgoing longshoreman could by any possibility have smelled out his way so cleverly our great admiral saw with his usual insight into frenchmen that if they remained at anchor we were sure to man their capstans for crappos fight well enough with a rush but unsteadily when at a standstill and worst of all when taken by surprise and outmanoeuvred and the manner in which the british fleet advanced was enough to strike them cold by its majesty and its awfulness for in perfect silence we were gliding over the dark blue sea with the stately height of the white sails shining and the sky behind us full of solemn yellow sunset even we so sure of conquest and so nerved with stern delight could not gaze on the things around us and the work before us without for a moment wondering whether the lord in heaven looked down at us at any rate we obeyed to the letter the orders both of our admiral and of a man scarcely less remarkable let not the sun go down on your wrath are the very words of st paul i believe and we never fired a shot until there was no sun left to look at it i stood by the men at the wheel myself and laid my own hand to it for it was a matter of very fine steerage to run in ahead of the french line wear soundings and then bear up on their larboard bow to deliver a thorough good raking broadside i remember looking over my left shoulder after we bore up our helm a weather while crossing the bows of the carrier as the foremost enemy's ship was called and there was the last limb of the sun like the hoof of a horse disappearing and my own head nearly went with it as the wind of a round shot knocked me over bear up bear up lads cried captain foley our time has come at last my boys well done llewellyn a finer sample of conning and steerage was never seen let go the best bower pass the word ready at quarters all of you now she bears clear fore and aft damn their eyes let them have it 
outrang the whole of our larboard battery almost like a single gun a finer thing was never seen and before the ring passed into a roar the yellow frenchman came through the smoke masts and spars flew right and left with the bones of men among them and the sea began to hiss and heave and the ships to reel and tremble and the roar of a mad volcano rose and nothing kept either shape or tenor except the faces of brave men every ship in our fleet was prepared to anchor by the stern so as to spring our broadsides aright but the anchor of the goliath did not bite so soon as it should have done so that we ran past the carrier and brought up on the larboard quarter of the second french seventy four with a frigate and a brig of war to employ a few of our starboard guns by this time the rapid darkness fell and we fought by the light of our own guns and now the skill of our admiral and his great ideas were manifest for every french ship had two english upon it and some of them even three at a time in a word we began with the head of their line and crushed it and so on joint by joint ere even the centre and much more the tail could fetch their way up to take part in it our antagonist was the first that struck being the second of the frenchman's line and by name the concurrent but she found in captain foley and david llewellyn an ant a little too clever to conquer we were a good deal knocked about with most of our main rigging shot away and all our masts heavily wounded nevertheless we drew ahead to double upon the third french ship of the wonderful name of sparticipate from this ship i received a shot which but for the mercy of the lord must have made a perfect end of me that my end may be perfect has long been my wish and the tenor of my life leads up to it nevertheless who am i to deny that i was not ready for the final finish at that very moment and now at this time of writing i find myself ready to wait a bit longer what i mean was a chain shot sailing along rather slowly as they always do and yet so fast that i could not either duck or jump at sight of it although there was light enough now for anything with the french admiral on fire happening to be well satisfied with my state of mind at that moment not from congratulation so much as from my inside conscience i now was beginning to fill a pipe and to dwell upon further manoeuvres for one of the foremost points of all after thoroughly drubbing the enemy is to keep a fine self-control and be ready to go on with it no sooner had i filled this pipe and taken a piece of wadding to light it which was burning handy in spite of all my orders than away went a piece of me and down went i as dead as a dutch herring at least so everybody thought who had time to think about it and the master's dead ran along the deck so far as time was to tell of it i must have lain numb for an hour i doubt with the roar of the guns and the shaking of bulkheads like a shiver jarring me and a pool of blood curdling into me and another poor fellow cast into the scuppers and clutching at me in his groaning when the heavens took fire in one red blaze and a thundering roar that might rouse the dead drowned all the rolling battle din i saw the white looks of our crew all aghast and their bodies scared out of death's manufacture by this triumph of mortality and the elbows of big fellows holding the linstock fell quivering back to their shaken ribs for the whole sky was blotched with the corpses of men like the stones of a crater cast upwards and the sheet of the fire behind them showed their knees and their bellies and streaming hair then with a hiss like electric hail from a mile's height all came down again corpses first being softer things and timbers next and then the great spars that had streaked the sky like rockets the violence of this matter so attracted my attention that i was enabled to rally my wits and lean on one elbow and look at it and i do assure you that anybody who happened to be out of sight of it lost a finer chance than ever he can have another prospect of for a hundred and twenty gun ship had blown up with an admiral and rear admiral not to mention a commodore and at least seven hundred complement and when the concussion was over there fell the silence of death upon all men not a gun was fired nor an order given except to man the boats in hopes of saving some poor fellows End of chapter sixty chapter sixty one of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty one a savage deed nevertheless our britons were forced to renew the battle afterwards 
because those frenchmen had not the manners to surrender as they should have done and they even compelled us to batter their ships so seriously and sadly that when we took possession some were scarcely worth the trouble to make us blow up their poor admiral was a distressing thing to begin with but when that was done to go on with the battle was as bad as the dog in the manger what good could it do them to rob a poor british sailor of half his prize-money and such conduct becomes at least twice as ungenerous when they actually have wounded him my wound was sore and so was i on the following day i can tell you for not being now such a very young man i found it a precious hard thing to renew the power of blood that was gone from me and after the terrible scene that awoke me from the first trance of carnage i was thrown by the mercy of providence into pure insensibility this i am bound to declare because the public might otherwise think itself wronged and perhaps even vote me down as of no value for failing to give them the end of this battle so brilliantly as the beginning i defy my old rival the newton taylor although a much younger man perhaps than myself and with my help a pretty good seaman to take up the tucks of this battle as well as i have done though not well done even if a tailor can come up and fight which he did for the honour of cambria none of his customers can expect any more than french chalk flourishes when a piece of description is down in his books however let him cut his cloth he is still at sea or else under it and if he ever does come home and sit down to his shop-board as his wife says he is sure to do his very first order shall be for a church-going coat with a doubled-up sleeve to it for the frenchman took my left arm away in a thoroughly lubberly manner if they had done it with a good cross-cut like my old wound of forty years standing i would at once have set it down to the credit of their nation but when i came to dwell over the subject as for weeks my duty was more and more clear to me it became that instead of honour they had now incurred a lasting national disgrace the fellows who charged that gun had been afraid of the recoil of it half a charge of powder makes the vilest fracture to deal with however there i was by the heels and now for nobler people only while my wound is green you must not be too hard on me the goliath was ordered to chase down the bay on the morning after the battle together with the theseus and a frigate called the leader this frigate was commanded by the hon rodney bluett now a post-captain and who had done wonders in the height of last night's combat he had brought up in the most brazen-faced manner without any sense of his mettle close below the starboard bow of the great three-decker orient and the quarter of the franklin and thence he fired away at both while all their shot flew over him and this was afterwards said to have been the cleverest thing done by all of us except the fine helm and calm handling of h m ship goliath the two ships in chase of which we were dispatched ran ashore and surrendered as i was told afterwards for of course i was down in my berth at the time with the surgeon looking after me and thus out of thirteen french sail of the line we took or destroyed eleven and as we bore up after taking possession the leader ran under our counter and hailed us have you a justice of the peace on board our captain replied that he was himself a member of the quorum but could not attend to such business now as making of wills and so on hereupon captain bluett came forward and with a polite wave of his hat called out that captain foley would lay him under a special obligation as well as clear the honour of a gallant naval officer by coming on board of the leader to receive the deposition of a dying man in ten minutes time our good skipper stood in the cockpit of the leader while captain bluett wrote down the confession of a desperately wounded seaman who was clearing his conscience of perilous wrong before he should face his creator the poor fellow sat on a pallet propped up by the bulkhead and a pillow that is to say if a man can sit who has no legs left him a round shot had caught him in the tuck of both thighs and the surgeon could now do no more for him indeed he was only enabled to speak or to gasp out his last syllables by gulps of raw brandy which he was taking with great draughts of water between them 
on the other side of his dying bed stood cannibals dick and joe howling and nodding their heads from time to time whenever he lifted his glazing eyes to them for confirmation for it was my honest and highly respected friend the poor jack wildman who now lay in this sad condition upon the very brink of another world and i cannot do better than give his own words as put into shape by two clear-witted men captains foley and rodney bluett only for the reader's sake i omit a great deal of groaning this is the solemn and dying delivery of me known as jack wildman a b seaman of h m frigate leader now off the coast of egypt and dying through a hurt and battle with the frenchman i cannot tell my name or age or where i was born or anything about myself and it does not matter as i have nothing to leave behind me dick and joe are to have my clothes and my pay if there is any and the woman that used to be my wife is to have my medals for good behaviour in the three battles i have partaken of my money would be no good to her because they never use it but the women are fond of ornaments i was one of a race of naked people living in holes of the earth at a place we did not know the name of i now know that it was nympton in devonshire which is in england they tell me no one had any right to come near us except the great man who had given us land and defended us from all enemies his name was parson chuan i believe but i do not know how to spell it he never told us of a thing like god but i heard of it every day in the navy whenever my betters were angry also i learned to read wonderful writings but i can speak the truth all the same ever since i began to put into clothes and taught to kill other people i have longed to tell of an evil thing which happened once among us how long ago i cannot tell for we never count time as you do but it must have been many years back for i had no hair on my body except my head we had a man then who took lead among us so far as there was any lead and i think that he thought himself my father because he gave me the most victuals. at any rate we had no other man to come near him in any cunningness our master joan came down sometimes and took a pride in watching him and liked him so much that he laughed at him which he never did to the rest of us this man my father as i may call him took me all over the great brown moors one night in some very hot weather in the morning we came to a great heap of houses and hid in a copse till the evening at dusk we set out again and came to a great and rich house by the side of a river the lower portholes seemed full of lights and on the flat place in front of them a band of music such as now i love was playing and people were dancing i had never heard such a thing before and my father had all he could do to keep me in the black trees out of sight of them and among the thick of the going about we saw our master juan in his hunting dress this must have been what great people call a masked ball i am sure of it since i saw one when in the bologna there were many women somewhere but at the end of the great light place looking out over the water there was a quiet shady place for tired people to rest a bit when the whole of the music was crashing like a battle and people going round like great flies in a web my father led me down by the riverside and sent me up some dark narrow steps and pointed to two little babies the whole of the business was all about these and the festival was to make much of them the nurse for a moment had set them upright while she just spoke to a young sailor man and crawling as all of us can i brought down these two babies to my father and one was heavy and the other light my father had scarcely got hold of them and the nurse had not yet missed them when on the dark shore by the riverside perhaps five fathoms under the gaiety parson chowan came up to my father and whispered and gave orders i know not what they said for i had no sense of tongues then nor desired it for we knew what we wanted by signs and sounds and saved a world of trouble so only i thought that our master was angry at having the girl child brought away he wanted only the boy perhaps who was sleepy and knew nothing but the girl child shook her hand at him and said e bad man bardy knows uh. i every one of us was amazed so very small oh sir i can tell you no more i think indeed then but you must my friend cried captain foley with spirit enough to set a dead man talking finish this story 
you thief of the world before you cheat the hangman two lovely childer stolen away from a first-rate family to give a ball of that kind and devil a bit you repent of it poor dying jack looked up at him and then at the place where his legs should have been and he seemed ashamed for the want of them then he played with the sheet for a twitch or two as if proud of his arm still remaining and checked back the agony tempting him now to bite it with his great white teeth ask the rest of us captain he said joe you know it dick you know it now that i am telling you the boy was brought up with us and you call him harry savage i knew the great house when i saw it again and i longed to tell the good old man there but for the sake of our people joan would have destroyed them all i was tempted after they pelted me so and the old man was so good to me but something always stopped me and i wanted poor harry to go to heaven oh a little drink of water captain foley was partly inclined to take a great deal of poor jack's confession for no more than the raving of a light-headed man but rodney bluett conjured him to take down every word of it and when this young officer spoke of his former chief and well-known friend now commodore sir drake bampfile being knighted for service in india and how all his life he had lain under a cloud by reason of this very matter not another word did our captain need from him but took up his pen again i ought to have told said the dying man slowly only i could not bring myself but now you will know you will all know now my father is dead but dick and joe can swear that the boy is the baby he had beautiful clothes on they shone in the boat but the girl child had on no more than a smock that they might see her dancing our master did not stay with us a minute but pushed us all into a boat on the tide cut the road and was back with the dancers my father had learned just enough of a boat to keep her straight in the tideway and i had to lie down over the babies to keep their white clothes from notice we went so fast that i was quite scared having never been afloat before so there must have been a strong ebb under us and the boat which was white must have been a very light one for she heeled with every motion at last we came to a great broad water which perhaps was the river's mouth with the sea beyond it my father got frightened perhaps and i know that i had been frightened long ago by a turn of the eddy we scrambled ashore and carried the boy baby with us but the boat broke away with a lurch as we jumped for we had not the sense to bring out the rope in half a minute she was off to sea and the girl baby lay fast asleep in her stern and now after such a long voyage in the dark we were scared so that we both ran for our lives and were safe before daybreak at nympton my father before we got home stripped off the little boy's clothes and buried them in a black moor-hole full of slime with a great white stone in the midst of it and the child himself was turned over naked to herd with the other children for none of our women look after them and nobody knew or cared to know who he was or whence he came except my poor father and our master and i myself many years afterwards but now i know well and i cannot have quiet to die without telling somebody the boy baby i was compelled to steal was sir philip bampfylde's grandson and the baby girl his granddaughter i never heard what became of her she must have been drowned or starved most likely but as for the boy he kept up his life and the man who took us most in hand of the name of father david gave the names to all of us and the little one harry savage now serving on board of the vanguard i know nothing of the buried images found by father david my father had nothing to do with that it may have been another of juan's plans i know no more of anything there let me die i have told all i know i can write my nickname i never had any other jack wildman at the end of this followed the proper things and the forms the law is made of with first of all the sign manual of our noble captain foley who must have been an irishman to lead us into the battle of the nile while in the commission of the peace and after him captain bluett signed and two or three warrant officers gifted with a writing elbow and then a pair of bare bone crosses meaning cannibals dick and joe who could not speak and much less write in the depth of their emotions End of chapter sixty one
chapter sixty two of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty two a rash young captain now if i had been sewn up well in a hammock and cast overboard as the surgeon advised who i should like to know would have been left capable of going to the bottom of these strange proceedings hezekiah was alive of course and prepared to swear to anything especially after a round shot must have killed him but for his greasiness and clever enough no doubt he was and suspicious and busy-minded and expecting to have all wales under his thumb because he was somewhere about on the skirts of the great battle i led them into but granting him skill and that narrow knowledge of the world which i call cunning granting him also a restless desire to get to the bottom of everything and a sniffing sense like a turnspit dog's of the shank and bone he is roasting none the more for all that could we grant him the downright power now loudly called for to put two and two together happily for all parties poor hezekiah was not required to make any further fool of himself the stump of my arm was in a fine condition when ordered home with the prizes and as soon as i felt the old bay of biscay over i knocked the doctor he fitted me with a hook after this in consistence with an old fisherman and now i have such a whole box full of tools to screw on that they beat any hand i ever had in the world if my neighbours would only not borrow them tush i'm railing at myself again always running down and holding up myself to ridicule out of pure contrariety just because every one else overvalues me there are better men in the world than myself there are wiser there are braver i will not be argued down about it there are some i am sure as honest in their way and a few almost as truthful however i never yet did come across any other man half so modest this i am forced to allude to now in departure from my usual practice because this quality had, and nothing else had prevented me from dwelling upon and far more from following up some shrewd thoughts which had occurred to me loosely i own and in a random manner still they had occurred to me once or twice and had been dismissed why so simply because i trusted other men's judgment and public impression instead of my own superior instinct and knowledge of weather and tide ways how bitterly it repented me now of this ill-founded diffidence when as we lay in the tops of the channel about the end of october with a nasty head wind baffling us captain rodney blewett came on board of us from the leader he asked if the doctor could report the master as strong enough to support an interview whereupon our worthy bone joiner laughed and showed him in to me where i sat at the latter end of a fine h bone of beef and then captain rodney produced his papers and told me the whole of his story i was deeply moved by jack wildman's death though edified much by the manner of it and some of his last observations for a naked heathen to turn so soon into a trousered christian and still more a good foretopman was an evidence of unusual grace even under such doctrine as mine was captain bluett spoke much of this although his religious convictions were not by any means so intense as mine while my sinews were under treatment but even with only one arm and a quarter i seemed to be better fitted to handle events than this young captain was his ability was of no common order as he had proved by running his frigate under the very chains of the thundering big frenchman so that they could not be down on him and yet he could not see half the bearings of jack wildman's evidence we had a long talk with some hot rum and water for the evenings already were chilly and my natural candour carried me almost into too much of it and the honourable rodney gazed with a flush of colour at me when i gave him my opinions like a raking broadside you may be right he said you were always so wonderful at a long shot llewellyn but really it does seem impossible captain i answered how many things seem so yet come to pass continually 
i cannot gainsay you llewellyn after all my experience of the world i would give my life to find it true but how are we to establish it leave me alone for that captain bluett if it can be done it shall be done the idea is entirely my own remember it had never occurred to you had it certainly not he replied with his usual downright honesty my reason for coming to you with that poor fellow's dying testimony was chiefly to cheer you up with the proofs of our old captain's innocence and to show you the turn of luck for young harry who has long been so shamefully treated and now i have another thing to tell you about him that is if you have not heard it no i have heard nothing at all i did not even know what had become of him until you read jack's confession with nelson on board the vanguard that was my doing said the honourable rodney i recommended him to volunteer and he was accepted immediately with the character i gave him but it is his own doing and proud i am of it that he is now junior lieutenant of admiral lord nelson's own ship the vanguard just before nelson received his wound and while powder was being handed up there came a shell hissing among them and hung with a sputtering fuse in the coil of a cable and the men fell down to escape it but young harry with wonderful quickness leaped as he did to save me in san domingo and sent the fuse over the side with a dash then nelson came up for the firing was hot and of course he must be in the thick of it and he saw in a moment what harry had done and he took down his name for promotion being just what himself would have loved to do it will have to be confirmed of course but of that there can be no question after all that we have done and when it turns out who he is i am heartily glad of it captain i cried the boy was worthy of any rank worth goes a little way birth a long way but all these things have to be lawfully proven oh you old village lawyer as we used to call you at old newton and you deserved it you rogue you did you may have lost your left hand but your right has not lost its cunning he spoke in the purest play and jest and with mutual esteem we parted only i stipulated for a good talk with him about our measures when i should have determined them or at the latest on reaching port the boldest counsel is often the best and naturally recommends itself to a man of warlike character my first opinion especially during the indignant period was that nothing could be wiser or more spirited or more striking than to march straight up to parson chowne and confront him with all this evidence taken down by a magistrate and dare him to deny it and then hale him off to prison and if the law permitted hang him that this was too good for him every one who has read my words must acknowledge the best thing moreover that could befall him for his body was good though his soul was bad and he might have some hopes to redeem the latter at the expense of the former and if he had not through life looked forward to hanging as his latter end and salvation it is quite impossible to account for the license he allowed himself however on second thoughts i perceived that the really weighty concern before us and what we were bound to think first of was to restore such a fine old family to its health and happiness to reinstate before he died that noble and most kind-hearted man full of religious feeling also and of confidence that the lord having made a good man would look after him which is the very spirit of king david when his self-respect returns in a word to replace in the world's esteem and what matters far more in true family love that fine and pure old gentleman the much troubled sir philip bampfylde this i say was the very first duty of a fellow nursed by a general and a baronet through the smallpox while it was also a feat well worthy of the master of a line of battle ship which was not lost in the battle of the nile and scarcely second even to this was the duty and joy of restoring to their proper rank in life two horribly injured and innocent creatures one of whom was our own bardie therefore upon the whole it seemed best to go to work very warily so it came to pass that i followed my usual practice of wholly forgetting myself and receiving from the honourable rodney bluett that most important document i sewed it up in the watered silk bag with my call and other muniments and set out for narnton court where i found both polly and the cook and the other comforts but nothing would do for our captain rodney all young men are so inconsiderate except to be off at racing speed for candleston court and his sweetheart delushy and the excellent colonel's old port wine and as he was so brisk i will take him first with your good leave if ever words of mine can keep up with him but of course you will understand that i tell what came to my knowledge afterwards 
with all the speed of men and horses young rodney bluett made off for home and when he got there his luck was such as to find delushy in the house it happened to be her visiting time according to the old arrangement and this crafty sailor found it out from the fine old woman at the lodge so what did he do but discharge his carriage and leave all his kit with her and go on with the sprite foot of a mariner to the ancient house which he knew so well then this tall and bold young captain entered by the butler's door the trick of which was well known to him and in a room out of the lobby he stood without his own mother knowing it it was the fall of autumnal night when everything is so rich and mellow when the waning daylight ebbs like a great spring-tide exhausted into the quickening flow of starlight and the plates were being cleared away after a snug dinner-party the good colonel sat at the head of his table after the lady's withdrawal with that modest and graceful kindliness which is the sure mark of true blood around him were a few choice old friends such as only good men have friends who would scout the evidence of their own eyes against him according to our fine old fashion these were drinking healths all round not with undue love of rare port so much as with truth and sincerity rodney made a sign to crumpy who had been shaking him by both hands until the tears prevented him just to please to keep all quiet touching his arrival and to let him have a slice or two of the haunch of venison put to grill if there was any left of it and give it him all on a plate together with a twelve-pound loaf of farmhouse bread such as is not to be had outside of great britain this was done in about five minutes for even mrs cook respected crumpy and being served up with a quart of ale in crumpy's own head privacy it had such a good effect that the captain was ready to face anybody oh crumpy was a most crafty old fellow which was one reason why i liked him as a contrast to my frankness and he managed it all and kept such a lookout that no one suspected him of any more than an honoured old chum in his stronghold captain bluett also knew exactly what his bearings were and from a loftier point of view than would ever occur to crumpy a man who had carried a fifty-gun ship right under the lower portholes of a one hundred and twenty-gun enemy and without any orders to that effect and only from want of some easier business he i think may be trusted to get on in almost anything this was the very thing i do believe occurring to the mind of somebody sitting as nearly as might be now upon a very beautiful sofa the loveliest work that you can imagine lay between her fingers and she was doing her very best to carry it on consistently but on her lap lay a london paper full of the highest authority and there any young eyes might discover a regular pit-pat of tears my dear my dear said lady bluett being not so very much better herself although improved by spectacles it is a dreadful dreadful thing to think of those poor frenchmen killed so many at a time and all in their sins i do hope they had time to think ever so little of their latter end it makes me feel quite ill to think of such a dreadful carnage and to know that my own son was foremost in it do you think my dear that your delicate throat would be any worse in the morning if you were to read it once more to me the people in the papers are so clever and there was something i did not quite catch about poor rodney's recklessness how like his dear father to be sure i see him in every word of it auntie the first time i read it was best the second and third time i cried worse and worse and the fourth time you know what you said of me and i know that i deserved it auntie for having such foolish weak eyes like that you know what i told you about captain rodney and begged you to let me come here no more and you know what you said that it was a child's fancy and if it were not it should take its course the colonel was wiser oh auntie auntie why don't you always hearken him for a very good reason my dear child he always proves wrong in the end and i don't i have the very highest and purest respect for my dear brother's judgment every one knows what his mind is and every one values his judgment and no stranger of course can enter into him his views and his largeness and intellect as i do when i agree with him there you have made me quite warm my dear i am so compelled to vindicate him i am so sorry i did not mean you know what i am auntie 
my dear i know what you are and therefore it is that i love you so now go and wash your pretty eyes and read that again to me and to the colonel many mothers would be proud perhaps i feel no pride whatever because my son could not help doing it there was something else this excellent lady's son could not help doing he caught the beautiful maid of scar in her pure white dress in a nook of the passage and with tears of pride for him rolling from her dark grey eyes and he could not help but all lovers i trow know how much to expect of him thank you rodney delushy cried to a certain extent i am grateful but if you please no more of it and you need not suppose that i was crying about 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 anything of course not you darling how long have i lived not to know that girls cry about nothing nine times out of ten at least pearly tears now prove your substance rodney will you let me alone i am not a french decker of five hundred guns for you to do just what you like with and i don't believe any one knows you are here yes 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 ever so many darlings if you like and with my whole heart i do love you as darling moxy says but one thing this moment i insist upon no not in your ear nor yet through your hair you conceited curly creature but at the distance of a yard i pronounce that you shall come to your mother oh what a shame and with that unfilial view of the subject he rendered himself after all those mortal perils into the arms of his mother with her usual quickness delushy fled but came back to the drawing-room very sedately and with a rose-coloured change of dress in about half an hour afterwards how do you do captain rodney bluett madame i hope that i see you well lady bluett was amazed at the coolness of them and in her heart disappointed although she was trying to argue it down and to say to herself how wise of them she knew how the colonel loved this young maid yet never could bear to think of his nephew taking to wife a mere waif of the sea the lady had faith in herself that she might in the end overcome this prejudice but of course if the young ones had ceased to care for it she could only say that young people were not of the stuff that young people used to be while she revolved these things in her tender warm and motherly bosom the gentlemen came from the dining-room to pay their compliments to the ladies and to have their tea and all that according to the recent style of it they bowed very decently as they came in not being topers by any means and the lady of the house arose and curtsied to them most gracefully then rodney who had found occasion ere this to salute colonel lower and his visitors led forward the maid and presented her to them with a very excellent naval bow my dear uncle and friends of the family he began while she trembled a little and looked at him with astonishment allow me the favour of presenting to you a lady who will do me the honour of becoming my wife very shortly i hope the colonel drew back with a frown on his face lady bluett on the other hand ran up what is the meaning of this she cried and not a word of it to your own mother oh andalusia how shocking of you i think sir said the colonel looking straight at the youth that you might have chosen a better moment to defy your uncle than in the presence of his oldest friends it is not like a gentleman sir it cuts me to the heart to say such a thing to the son of my own sister but sir it is not like a gentleman the old friends nodded to one another in approval of this sentiment and turned to withdraw from a family scene wait if you please cried rodney bluett colonel lower i should deserve your reproach if i had done anything of the kind my intention is not to defy you sir but to please you and gratify you my dear uncle as your life-long kindness to me and to this young lady deserves and i have chosen to do it before old friends that your pleasure may be increased by their congratulations instead of being ashamed sir of the origin of your future niece or you my dear mother of your daughter you may well be proud of it she belongs to one of the oldest families in the west of england she is the grandchild of sir philip bampfylde of narnton court near barnstaple and i think i have heard my mother speak of him as an old friend of my father to be sure to be sure exclaimed lady bluett ere the colonel could recover himself the bluetts are an old west country family but the bampfylde's even older come to me my pretty darling there don't cry so or if you must come in here and i will help you rodney my dear you have delighted us and you have done it most cleverly 
but excuse my saying that an officer in the army would have known a little better what ladies are than to have thrown them into this excitement even in the presence of valued friends come here my precious the gentleman will excuse us for a little while let me kiss colonel lower first whispered delushy all frightened crying and quivering as she was she could not forget her gratitude so she bowed her white forehead and drooped her dark lashes under the old man's benevolent gaze sit down my dear friend said colonel lower as soon as the ladies had left the room my good nephew's tactics have been rather blunt and of the aboukir order however he may be quite right if this matter requires at once to be spread abroad at any rate my dear boy i owe you an apology rodney i beg your pardon for the very harsh terms i used to you with these words he stood up and bowed to his nephew who did the same to him in silence and then they shook hands warmly after which the young captain told his story to which they all listened intently five being justices of the shire and one the lord lieutenant all accustomed to examine evidence it seems very likely said colonel lower as they waited for his opinion that david llewellyn is a most shrewd fellow but he ought to have said more about the boat there is one thing however to be done at once to collect confirmative evidence there is another thing to be done at once cried rodney bluett warmly to pull chowne's nose and despite his cloth i will do it roundly my young friend said the lord lieutenant prove it first and then i think there are some people who would pardon you End of chapter 62